The 2013 Ludwig von Mises Memorial Lecture is sponsored by Dr. Don Prince, who is with us today. Uh, the lecture will be presented by Dominic Armentano. Dr. Armentano is a professor emeritus in economics at the University of Hartford in Connecticut and an associated scholar of the Mises Institute. He also taught at the University of Connecticut, where he received his PhD in economics in 1966. In the spring of 1984, he was Shelby Cullum Davis Visiting Professor at Trinity College. Dr. Armentano is the author of The Myths of Antitrust, Economic Theory, and Legal Cases, and Antitrust and Monopoly, Anatomy of a Policy Failure. The first of these books, um, I might add, was um, really the first book written by an Austrian um, in the generation that followed, Murray, uh, followed the Rothbard and Kersner, and it was, it was the first one that I read by someone other than Kersner, Rothbard, and Mises. Um, Dr. Armentano's essays and articles have, have appeared in many other books, including William Snavely's Theory of Economic Systems, Yale Brosen's The Competitive Economy, and Louis M. Spadaro's New Directions in Austrian Economics. His shorter articles and reviews have appeared in such journals and newspapers as the Antitrust Bulletin, Business and Society Review, the New York Times, National Review, Wall Street Journal, and the Cato Journal. Professor Armentano and his wife reside in Vero Beach, Florida. Please give a warm welcome to my friend, Dom Marmentano. Several months ago, <clears throat> Joe Salerno from the Mises Institute sent me an email. He said that he'd noticed that the 2000, that 2012 was the 40th anniversary of the publication of Myths of Antitrust, and the 30th anniversary of Antitrust and Monopoly, which was published in 1982. He suggested that to commemorate these publications that I come here today to talk a little bit about my background, my interest in Austrian economics, and how those two books came to be written and published. So that's the context of the talk that I will give today. It's not going to be a formal antitrust lecture by any means. It's going to be a background, it's going to be background historical material on myself and how those books came to be published and perhaps uh, the meaning of those books in terms of uh, the development of public policy. I'd like to thank Joe for the invitation, to thank Lou Rockwell for his stewardship of the Mises Institute and his support for me over the years and to Don, Dr. Don Prince for generously supporting this year's von Mises Lecture, and to the conference coordinator, Pat Barnett, for taking care of my accommodations and arrangements for this talk. Thank you very much. I was born in the north end of Hartford, Connecticut in late 1940. The north end is not the good end. The good end is the South End, or at least it was back then, with excellent Italian bakeries and gelati ice sold in paper cups on street corners. My closest well-off relatives lived in the South End. I call them well-off because my uncle always drove a Cadillac, and my cousin, my cousin had a piano and a train set that covered the living room floor. But my parents, my sister, and I lived in the North End of Hartford, in a two-bedroom, third-floor tenement apartment. When my sister and I brought the garbage down to the outdoor shed every night, we'd see the rats scrambling around, rattling the garbage can covers. The neighborhood that we lived in was poor Italian, poor Jewish, poor Polish, with a sprinkling of blacks. Today, to go into the north end of Hartford, to Martin Street and to Barber Street and to Keeney Park, where I grew up, would require a flak jacket and a total absence of any common sense. <laughs> when I was 11 years old, my father had a serious fight with our landlord, and we had to move out. We eventually moved out of the city to the country where my, where my dad was in the process of building a house. He was not a professional builder. His regular job was as a salesman for a plumbing and heating supply company in Hartford. But he went to the public library, and he took out books on building houses, and he decided that he could do it, and he did it. 
I have photographs of my mother and I on the roof of our first house in the country, holding roofers in place and nailing shingles. Now, like most kids, I would rather have been playing baseball somewhere. But most weekends back then were for manual work so that we could get the hell out of Hartford. I grew up in the 1950s with a strong sense of optimism and romanticism about life. Baseball and cars were important. Acting in school plays was important. Frank Sinatra singing on Capitol Records was important. Ayn Rand was always important. Gene Kelly dancing with Leslie Caron in An American in Paris was very important, still is. That cultural sense of life, that really good things were possible with reason and with hard work, infused my own worldview and my goals. In grammar school and in high school, I was fortunate enough to have had two extraordinary teachers who encouraged me to write stories, to put my thoughts on paper. I didn't need much encouragement. I loved writing, and it always came naturally to me. In almost 50 years of writing, I don't ever recall having writer's block or being late with a promise writing assignment. I have, of course, worked hard at my writing over the years. Now it's almost second nature to write, say, an op-ed piece for LouRockwell.com on the insane policies of the Federal Reserve. But where that initial desire to write stories came from is, frankly, a total mystery. I simply have no idea. There are no writers in my family. My mom. Uh, got to the eighth grade, my father graduated high school, but I don't ever recall them writing anything or even being great readers. My serious interest in Austrian economics started in college and in graduate school, where outside the classroom, not in the classroom, I first read people like Henry Hazlitt and Hayek and Mises and Schumpeter, and especially Murray Rothbard. I also remember reading an antitrust essay written by someone named Alan Greenspan in Rand's Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. As an undergraduate at the University of Connecticut, I remember arguing with one of my economics professors, Dr. Paul Weiner, over a textbook that he had assigned in my first antitrust course. That textbook was Claire Wilcox's infamous Public Policies Towards Business, published by Irwin. And Professor Weiner believed every word of it, and he expected his students to do the same. The Wilcox text was certainly the conventional economic wisdom at the time. The orthodox antitrust mantra went something like this. Pure competition was the ideal in terms of efficient resource allocation, Big firms colluded or exercised monopoly power, and the government's antitrust laws were there to protect consumers, and they did protect consumers. End of any serious discussion. When I raised some objections to all of this, I was an undergraduate at the time, Professor Weiner dismissed Henry Hazlitt as a mere journalist, and he dissed Alan Greenspan as an Ayn Rand devotee without a PhD. And Murray Rothbard, well, he had never even heard of Murray Rothbard. One episode with Professor Weiner sticks out in my mind sometime around the spring of 1960. Weiner would often dare some of his students to come back to his office and argue public policy questions with him. Frequently, by the way, he wouldn't show, but. <laughs> I recall he had a blackboard in his office, and once in the heated discussion with some of his students, including me, he allowed me to write something on that blackboard that I thought was quite profound at the time, as an undergraduate I did. I wrote, quote, there is no competition in pure competition, close quote. When I, fin when I finished writing, Weiner just looked at me like I was from another planet, and he, and he shook his head. He didn't get what I had written, and he told me to go back and study harder. Now, that's pretty much the way it was back in 1960. Things were slightly better in grad school. Professor Bill Snavely nurtured my budding interest in Austrian economics by assigning me a term paper on the so-called calculation debate between Mises, Hayek, and the socialists. 
shortly after I graduated, <clears throat> I would contribute an article um, <clears throat> on that intellectual debate, decisively won by the Austrians, I might add, in a book that Bill published called Theory of Economic Systems that Joe uh, referenced. That article was my first professional contribution along purely Austrian lines. My passion for antitrust theory and law was expanding en enormously in grad school. I studied under Professor Joel Durlam, who was a well-published antitrust expert. Durlam was a crusty old school, school progressive, and we constantly disagreed about almost everything. Durlam had published a book called Fair Competition, and uh, like the debate about fair trade, um, he, made, he made the same mistake. Again, the, the, let's have an equal playing field before we can have a competitive struggle. Um, so there were all kinds of things in his book, uh, all kinds of interventions that the government had to do to establish a fair playing field in, uh, in the antitrust area. <clears throat> Nonetheless, Durlam challenged me uh, to prove him wrong by allowing me to argue with him in class. That was, that was new. He also challenged me to go beyond the textbooks we were using, one of which was his, uh, and actually go read the original court documents and witness testimony in antitrust cases. No, no one had ever suggested that I do that before. Professor Durlam, of course, would eventually cook his own goose with that suggestion. <laughs> Because that's when I first began to realize, when I went to the law library and started to read those decisions, how distorted the conventional understanding of antitrust really was. Even more importantly, I also began to realize that Durham and most economists and most law professors at the time had gotten most of their antitrust policy conclusions dead wrong because they had accepted fundamentally inappropriate theories of competition and monopoly but more on that later. My first book, Myths of Antitrust, Economic Theory and Legal Cases, was published by Arlington House in 1972. How did it come to be written? The answer is that when I first went to the University of Hartford to teach in 1967, I was asked to teach a senior level course called Government and Business. The Wilcox text that I mentioned before <clears throat> had already been ordered by, by by my department head before I arrived on campus. And the students and I both struggled with its poor reasoning and total absence of empirical information. It was at the end of my first year of teaching that I decided that I would write a textbook consistent with some of the research that I was doing and with the lectures that I was giving. Little did I realize then how wildly inaccurate conventional antitrust theory and history really were. And little did I realize that writing a case book in this area would be a substantial undertaking requiring several years of research and writing. In addition, I had a new wife, no external funding, no research assistance. How do you like that, guys? No research assistance. And of course, no word processor. I did have a portable Smith Corona typewriter to pound the way on, and so I began to pound away. For those of you who are unfamiliar with myths, let me tell you a little bit what I tried to do here. The myths book was an attempt to do a major revisionist history of antitrust theory and policy. The state of Connecticut had an excellent law library in Hartford, so I buried myself in legal decisions and trial record material for almost four years. My primary intent was to discover and report what actually happened in the classic antitrust cases from an economic perspective. To my knowledge, back then, no economist had as yet written a book-length criticism of antitrust enforcement. The Robert Bork book, The Antitrust Paradox, appeared six years after Miss of Antitrust was published. That book, as some of you may recall, is also highly critical of conventional antitrust theory and policy. But Bork, of course, was not an economist and certainly not an Austrian. He also thought antitrust policy should be reformed and not abolished. Bork was a lawyer by training, and indeed the subject had been left mostly to the lawyers. <clears throat> 
and to the law professors, who apparently were blissfully unaware of the economic evidence in the antitrust cases, and that it often contradicted their public interest legal analysis. Unlike the lawyers, I was interested in primarily two issues. One, what economic theory of competition and monopoly was the government and the courts accepting as legitimate in these cases? And two, did the business firms accused of antitrust violations actually abuse consumers? And therefore, was antitrust a legitimate response to so-called free market monopolization? I made an early decision with this to tell the story of the classic monopoly cases, antitrust cases, in the context of the actual historical development of the industry. For example, how did the market structure in the petroleum industry or in the tobacco industry actually arise? There's two classic antitrust cases against petroleum companies and tobacco companies. How did that market structure arise? How did that so-called free market monopolization problem arise in that industry? Why did the firms merge in tobacco and in oil? And were there so-called barriers to entry that unfairly kept profits up and new competitors out? Did that actually happen? Absent some historical discussion, the monopoly and price fixing antitrust cases don't make any sense. And the actual intent and effect of the antitrust regulation remains obscure. Thus, examining, for example, the classic decision against Standard Oil, 1911, in the context of the historical development of the petroleum industry, would give a unique understanding to my competition and monopoly analysis and sharply separate my books from any of the competitors because my understanding is no one had done that. And after more than 40 years in print and various editions, I still think that the perspective that I adopted and the analysis that I attempted in the first book still holds up reasonably well. Miss of Antitrust attempted to break several areas of new ground. It systematically attacked the dominant structure conduct performance paradigm that dominated industrial organization theory and public policy back in the 1950s and 1960s. It presented an alternative quasi Schumpeterian theory of open market competition to replace the orthodox perfectly competitive equilibrium model. In addition, the book exposed the soft underbelly of the public interest theory of antitrust by demonstrating that the firms indicted and convicted in the classic monopoly cases had actually been increasing outputs, lowering prices, and innovating. Where available, I stuck the actual consumer prices and industry data right in the text. And no one had done that before. <clears throat> In its most radical chapter, the one on price fixing, Miss argued that the effectiveness of business collusion was also an antitrust fairy tale, since high fixed costs and legally open markets always encouraged price cheating and secret discounts to customers. It even showed that the electrical equipment conspiracy of the early 1960s, perhaps the most infamous price fixing case in all antitrust history, had not really worked as intended. The companies cheated, broke their agreements constantly, and prices were never fixed. Thus, myths concluded that the entire body of antitrust policy, even including the price fixing cases, was a complete policy hoax. And that absent any legitimate economic rationale, the entire legal framework hurt consumers and should be abolished. Now, getting this published with that analysis and those conclusions proved difficult. <laughs> My recollection is that, and this 
goes back many years now, I've got to recollect. My recollection is that at least six mainstream academic publishers rejected the book on the advice of academic reviewers. I do remember that Norton Publishers actually sent me, at my request, several referee comments on my early chapters. I had only submitted six chapters. <clears throat> Reading those comments was very, very depressing. Several of the reviewers claimed that I simply had no idea what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> Moreover, they thought that my policy conclusions were, well, outrageous. Now, I will admit that to argue that the antitrust laws actually hurt competition and hurt consumers, and that the only rational solution is to repeal the laws, was indeed far, far outside the mainstream in 1970. Yet naive as I was in those early days, I expected my theoretical arguments and case facts to be treated seriously. I was wrong. The mainstream, mainstream academic publishers and their reviewers wanted no part of Myths of Antitrust, even with a different title. So eventually, I would send the mostly completed manuscript to David Frankie at Arlington House. And the book was published, was completed, and then published in 1972. The immediate reaction to my book in the business and academic world was far less than I'd hoped, but about what I expected. Despite some important favorable reviews, especially one by economist Donald Dewey, who's always been a friend, Donald Dewey from at Columbia. <clears throat> in fact, he once told me my book was better than the Bork book after the Bork book had come out. Book sales of myths were modest, and the antitrust intellectual establishment did not come crumbling down. Indeed, most economists and law professors in the early 1970s simply chose to ignore what I'd written and or called instead for more vigorous enforcement of antitrust law. Indeed, back then, there was even strong support for new antitrust laws to limit industrial concentration which only goes to show that the academic investment in old intellectual capital runs very, very deep. But there were at least two general exceptions to the academic indifference to what I'd written. At Chicago, at least in the business school, and at UCLA in particular, various scholars such as Yale Brosen and Jim Liebler at UCLA were reasonably sympathetic to my arguments, and both published later on their own important critiques of antitrust policy. However, the Chicago UCLA crowd was always lukewarm to me and to my arguments, since I had attacked the perfectly competitive equilibrium model, and had argued that even prosecuting price fixing was a mistake. I remember long arguments with E.L. Brosen on this. <clears throat> Besides, I had called for repeal of the antitrust laws and not reform, which made me an extremist and a non-player in the academic government merry-go-round. But a second group of supporters, the Austrians, led by Murray Rothbard, were very enthusiastic about my work, and I was soon drawn into their intellectual world in a more systematic way. But that's a story for another time. By the early 1980s, 10 years after myths came out, the antitrust landscape had changed somewhat. And I was encouraged enough to send a revised edition of myths to John Wiley and Sons, a legitimate academic publisher in New York. Some weeks later, I still remember the phone call. I was in my office at the University of Hartford, preparing for my evening class, when a courageous editor from Wiley called a man named John Mahaney, and he said, <clears throat> I'm sitting here, and I'm reading your manuscript, and Wiley wants to publish it. And at one point I said, you know, Mr. Mahaney, the book 
the manuscript calls for the complete repeal of the antitrust laws. He said, yes, yes, that's what I understand, and John Wiley still wants to publish it. Bingo. And that book was eventually published in 1982 called Antitrust and Monopoly, Anatomy of a Policy Failure. Now, that book sold reasonably well, and uh, it had many positive reviews. And it's still in print today with the Independent Institute in Oakland. And I still get small royalty checks, enough to go to Burger King with. <laughs> What's interesting, of course, is the guts of that book is still myths of antitrust. If anybody's got the two books, you can compare them. I'll talk about the differences in a minute. but. Yet the antitrust world had changed just enough in 10 years to get antitrust and monopoly treated the new book far more reasonably by reviewers this time around. I, I got, for what I'd said, the radical things I'd said, I, I, th I think I got pretty good reviews. <clears throat> so the lesson to young scholars out there, <clears throat> you have to hang in there. <clears throat> Uh, I talk a bit about the differences between the two books. The Myths of Antitrust book has an introductory chapter where I talk about how the market works uh, in theory. Um, and when Wiley got the book, they said, look, everybody know The economists are going to read your book, know how the market process works. <clears throat> and we, we don't think we need that chapter. Get, you're, you've written a book about competition, monopoly, and antitrust law. Get to it. So we dropped the uh, opening chapter in uh, Myths. It doesn't appear in the Antitrust and Monopoly book. Um, there's also a, an extended discussion of the petroleum industry beyond Standard Oil uh, and all the interventions and all the monop state monopoly that shows up after that decision and, and how that industry developed as a consequence of that. Uh, that was all added when I was on sabbatical out at the Institute of Humane Studies, and they allowed me to do some additional research and writing on that. So we added that. And there's some, there's some new antitrust cases that 10 years had gone by, so I added a couple of cases, as I recall. But the guts of the book is still a mess of antitrust. Actually, the only blatantly unfair review of antitrust and monopoly that I ever got came years later in 1991 from the dean of the old school antitrust establishment, F.M. Shearer. Somebody knows who he is. <laughs> Frederick Shearer, I think he's still alive. Frederick Shearer is a, was a Harvard-trained economist, had been chief economist with the Federal Trade Commission for a while, and was or is the author of what used to be the best-selling antitrust textbook, Industrial Organization and Public Policy, which had instructed generations of antitrust economists and had been through umpteen editions. Professor Shearer and I had actually met years before while we were giving opposing lectures on antitrust at Hillsdale. He gave a lecture one night, I gave a lecture the following night, as I recall, and then we had a lunch our luncheon discussion on antitrust, especially on price fixing, had not been pleasant. <laughs> and Shearer's rather shrill and purposely inaccurate review of my book in the journal Critical Review in 1991 was payback, apparently, for having the audacity to challenge his antitrust worldview. Now, the Critical Review editor, bless his heart, I think it was Jeff Friedman, allowed me to write a detailed point-by-point -point rebuttal to Shearer's hatchet job on my book. A rebuttal which we cannot detail here, but which must be read by anyone seriously interested in these controversies. If you're interested in these controversies, you should read Shearer's attack on my book and what I said in rebuttal. I regard my rejoinder to Shearer as one of my finest and most persuasive pieces of professional writing. <clears throat> 
My guess is that Shearer never let his own students read my point-by-point -point dismantling of his antitrust views. What's going on in the antitrust world today? <clears throat> well, you, you must understand that I've been, I haven't been teaching since 1994. Uh, so I haven't kept up with the journals. I've tried to keep up with some of the antitrust stuff that goes on, public policy stuff. Certainly kept up with the Microsoft uh, debacle that went on for almost 10 years. <clears throat> so having said that, well, all of the antitrust laws still exist. Even the blatantly anti-consumer robinson patman Act has not been repealed. Even liberal economists, even some liberal economists don't think the robinson patman Act should be there. The antitrust division of the Department of Justice still brings antitrust cases. There's still pri many private antitrust cases that go on. Federal Trade Commission is not going out of business. Although they are a wee bit more restrained and more rational than they were 20 years ago. I will say that. With the recent appointment of, of Josh Wright to the Federal Trade Commission, I expect that trend to continue. Yeah, he's a good person, and he has important and mostly correct views on antitrust policy. And while neo-Austrian theories of competition in the market process are taken far more seriously today than, say, 30 years ago, nonetheless, the structure, conduct, performance, and barriers to entry paradigm Though amended and though modified and though mathematized, still dominates discussions of so-called monopoly power and is still legally relevant in tying agreement cases, in monopoly cases, in proposed business merger cases, and of course in all price fixing cases. One has only to look back a few years at the decade-long Microsoft prosecutions or look forward at the current antitrust case against Apple Computer and several book publishers. Apple will go to court on June 5th in New York in a major antitrust case, unless they settle before then, to realize that the general antitrust myth and hoax still survives. The antitrust establishment, the lawyers, the bureaucrats, the academics, and yes, the corporations who benefit from antitrust regulation still hold the high ground in this struggle between liberty and governmental power. I'm sometimes asked whether calling for the repeal of antitrust laws was a strategic mistake on my part. Didn't I hurt the cause by taking such extreme theoretical and policy positions? Now, that's certainly an important and fair question. Strategy questions are fair. <clears throat> Jim Liebler, a now deceased UCLA law professor and an old friend, once told me that I had made two strategic mistakes. The first was that I had not graduated from Yale or Harvard. <laughs> he said that my arguments would have been taken far more seriously if I had. Jim was probably right about that. The second was that I had called for repeal and not reform of antitrust law. Jim assured me that that sort of extremism just never goes over well with the legal and intellectual establishment. <laughs> Again, Jim was probably right about that too. Ironically, Jim Liebler had made some serious strategic mistakes of his own. You may know that name. He was a staff attorney for the Warren Commission back in the 1960s and inadvertently perhaps a part of the cover-up and whitewash of the assassination of John Kennedy. But again, that's definitely a story for another time. <laughs> Strategic mistakes aside, I wouldn't be at peace with myself or be presenting the von Mises lecture here today at Auburn if I had gone only halfway with my theoretical arguments or policy recommendations. The fact remains that all antitrust regulation and its regulation 
is economically inefficient and morally wrong. And all of it, the laws and the enforcement agencies should be thrown out. I say this because it's right and because it's true and because it's always our obligation, regardless of the consequences, to speak truth to power. That's a tradition, I'm told, that has been followed quite religiously here at the Mises Institute under Lou Rockwell. And finally, a quote that all economists and law professors need to memorize, and you'll know a part of the quote, at least. In fact, this was part of the debate that Shearer and I had when we had that little luncheon. He, he remembered the part that businessmen rarely meet together when, they don't, when they're not contriving a conspiracy against the public. But he forgot the second part of the quotation. So I'll read the whole quotation for you. Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, written 238 years ago. Still sounds absolutely correct to me. Quote, people of the same trade meet together, seldom meet together, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. It, no, nothing left out here now, it is impossible, indeed, to prevent such meetings by any law which either could be executed or would be consistent with liberty and justice. Thank you very much. Thank you.